Here's what we're going to start with. One of the ones I put on the list was fake awards. So particularly, yeah. uh, I find it very funny thing that there's a couple people on TikTok now that have fake gold records in their background for every shot. And it's really funny because it's always been easy to fake a gold record to somebody who doesn't know what they are looking at. But I guess I have to actually go get mine to prove this and, you know, major flex. Give me a second. You see, basically, you can buy a pretend gold record for anyone, right? Like they're kind of a novelty gift, right? And the other piece is that if you don't know what you're looking at or if it's an indie label, sometimes people do buy gold records or just because whatever we were talking about doing it for an indie label I work with because they had sold 10,000 units and that was something we wanted to celebrate. And there's when you start to like dig into all the award type things, uh, there's a lot of weird variations. But Jesse has a real one. Jesse, show us this. Okay, so this RIA hologram thing, that's what makes a gold record real. And it's it's so funny because this, like I look and like the one person I'm particularly talking about on TikTok has more followers than Matt and I combined. And they always talk about all their big accolades. And you're like, every one of those records in the back is fake. It's so funny because... Obviously, most people don't get trained to know that, but like they're always selling themselves, and this is another one on our list, as gurus, mentors, every fucking time. Every fucking time they say it, and I think one of the best rules, because we want to give you a bunch of rules to follow to know things, when somebody is proclaiming they are a mentor or a guru, you should know that that's basically like saying snake oil salesman. Yeah. Matt. Matt, um, what do you think that? So I just want to wrap up on this fake awards thing real fast because there's a whole other side that Jesse didn't even touch on. Mm-hmm. So fake gold records, cool. But there's a lot of like fake companies out of LA especially that will send like every new artist they can find on Spotify. They'll scrape the emails or whatever and they'll send them emails and be like, you've been selected for the awards. Yes. Um, you know, uh, all you have to do uh, to be entered is to pay a small fee. And like, it's very weird. I went to one of these ones. It was very strange. A uh, bunch of no name artists who paid to perform at the industry showcase, which seemed to mostly have people working at like weird scam companies. And you have to pay to get into the party the same way you have to pay to like be a Grammy member, but also go to the Grammy event. Mm-hmm. And they try to like portray it as a baby Grammys or whatever. And like most of the time, it's just no, you know, and ultimately when it comes to the award stuff, like, first of all, if strangers aren't coming to your shows, you did not get nominated for anything. Second, if you go and look at the previous winners in your category or, you know, and you haven't heard of any of them, like at all, that means it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I, I think one thing to always remember when people are like, oh, I want this award. It's like, if someone sees you have no monthly listeners and no stream ratio, no follower ratio, which everyone knows how to do, I think, you know, it's always the easiest thing to be called out. Derek Quiethouse has a thing that he's interjected that I think is important to put in here is that he agrees gurus are overrated, mentor prayers. I think he's right that I may have cast a little too wide a net on mentor. There is real mentoring things. I think it's really when somebody brands themselves in their name. So like, here's a good example is da, 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 the mentor. That's, I've never seen someone who brands themselves in the first yeah. title as the mentor. Was, That's not scamming. I, and I know you don't do that, Derek. Yeah. And all, cause ultimately like you and I do have, I want to point out something here. Jesse and I do have mentoring programs. Well, um, I do. I do not. I, I just consult. Consult. I don't consider that yeah. mentoring. While I think it's good to mentor people, I don't like to call what I do mentoring because I don't think That's it's worth fair. it for people to pay as much as I cost for on an ongoing basis that actually need mentoring. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think the last thing I would like to say, though, is that like even like a funny thing is, is I see all the time 34 time Grammy award winning producer. Uh, you'll see like that all the time. It was mixed by this 35 time Grammy nominated person. While that's very nice, 
it really does not do anything for you because everybody in this business who's experienced has learned that credits are easy to get as well as like Grammy nominations. It's like that can mean that that person did that 30 years ago and their sound is so out of date. It just, I, I have to say, I think awards are some of the most like and, amateurs value them. Professionals really go, okay, yeah, that means nothing. If like, you know, it's one thing if you are Billie Eilish and you won Best New Artist. It's another thing if you were nominated for Best Engineer for a comedy album. And that means that you put up one fader. Yeah. And this is like one of the things to realize is that very frequently, especially, especially in the producer engineer world, this is not to talk shit. I understand why they do it. But anyone who has any affiliation with a Grammy-winning record throws that in their resume. Mm -hmm. And like we, we could talk today about what a scam the Grammys are one day. <laughs> good lord! Let's move on to gurus. We've oh yes, yes, yes. Let's, let's 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 move on to gurus specifically. That's that's really the one. Especially, I think um, Rick Rubin promoting this book has really brought on a um, slew oh, of yeah. like people who think they're. Rick Rubin because they read that book and then call themselves a guru because they wish they had his clout and oh, 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 I like this comic Grammys more like the scammies, but Matt, where would you like to start yeah. with gurus? Here's my take every single time. There's three things I know. We're going to do this bacon spit style. Three <laughs> things. <laughs> I, 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 whoa. I feel like I'm watching TikTok again. Three things I notice that uh, are kind of define the fake guru thing. And for the record, if you do a consultant call with me, I will teach you stuff bacon spit style improvised. It's very entertaining. But the first thing is, is there content sort of music business adjacent and only hate content? Or is there actual advice? Because if you actually watch a lot of these people on TikTok, and this blows my mind, but like there's a couple people who are... Uh, pretty obsessed with jesse and i because they're they're jealous what he's not we should we should make the clarification what he's saying people are pretty obsessed we're, we're saying that there's an industrial complex of people who do what we do who basically uh throw shade tiktoks at matt and i all day long and we uh have a text thread where we just laugh at them yeah but the the point being what i noticed with a lot of those people is like look at someone's content and figure out if it's all industry news, hate, and mindset tips, but no actual, like, advice, then that guy is not real. Like, I definitely have content that's, like, some of the content is mindset stuff. But yeah. Jesse actually had a really good rule of thumb the other day where he said, he said to me, we were texting, and you were like, if it's over 20% mindset, it's probably bullshit. And I think that's basically accurate, you know, is, like... Mindset stuff is important, but that should not, but that's like some of the lowest hanging fruit. Like if someone can't like give you a meaningful, meaningful advice that clearly is being used, then it's probably a scam. The other thing, the other two things, two, who do they work with? What you'll notice is a lot of these guys can't concretely be like, oh, I work with X, Y, and Z. You know, like that's why like when I do my like sales videos, I'll be like, hey, Here's who I work with, so you can see I'm legit. And that list is like a bunch of big names. That's to like help you understand I'm real. Because a lot of these other people trying to do stuff do not work with anyone anyone cares about. You know, and like ultimately, if I was gonna hire someone, would I want to work with someone who's like doing hundreds of thousands of dollars of business for big bands or someone who's weird and does, you know, like allegedly helps indie artists so whatever and then the final thing i think is like is this has this person actually been doing this for a long time because you saw this especially during covid a lot of like gurus just popping up because i just needed to figure out a way to make money and they were in a band once right but it's like i i may have ghost written, i may have ghost written some of their content before i launched my youtube channel did you really? <laughs> Have we never talked about that? I do want to point out, Derek has another great comment here, uh, Quiet House Recording. There's also no such thing as a Grammy Award winning studios. Studios don't win Grammys. People do. Yeah. And that is, we when we talk about music business scams, that's like one of the funniest things because like, I keep talking about the um, 
Van Halen greed M&M's thing, which a lot of people get wrong. There's a great Harvard Business Review article where everybody makes fun of Van Halen because they would say, we want a dresser filled with greed M&M's. But what people don't understand about it is that that would tell them how much the venue took their needs seriously. And if they saw that there was just M&M's in there, they'd hire 10 more people to work on the venue because they're going to need backup. If they saw there was just a few that were um, different colors, they would hire two more people. And if everything was fine, they would just go about their day and know that this venue has their shit together. I think one of the things, like a good example is I had to hire out a studio recently in Vancouver for a thing to do with an artist I'm working with. We needed to do a remote session where we commented to, to the person in Vancouver. And I saw a Grammy award-winning studio. I'm like, we're not doing it there. I know that that is a green M&M of bullshit, that that person's totally lying. Yeah, absolutely. So just keep keep those things in mind. Yeah. Cool. Playlisters. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's 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 get it. This, this one, I think, has some nuance. So I particularly have been thinking about this a lot because there's been a TikTok I wanted to reply to from uh, Venture Music about this. One of the things I think that's very weird, and it's often a debate Matt and I get into, is that some people talk as if the, the genre of music they work in is a monolith of everything. Playlists in hip hop, yeah. pop, and EDM have become that if you can find a good one, you are the world's greatest detective. But in plenty of other more obscure genres, there are so many cool playlists you can submit to. Yeah. I work across a ton of different genres and I see all the time people being like, there's only scammers and paid playlisters. And I'm like, that's true in your genre, but it's not true in so many of them. Yeah, I think that the way I always describe it is like playlisting, if you find a good one, and even if they charge you, but it's a good one, you're fucking set, right? Like, because I have a client, you know, a small stoner rock client who gets like 50 streams a day on a song because he just found the right playlist and his music is the exact right fit, right? And if you're like really leaning into a certain niche and then you go look up all the playlists in that niche and pitch to everyone and you do some research to make sure those playlists are legit, yeah, that's awesome. But what you definitely see happening a lot is people botted playlists a few years ago, and that was a lot easier, built up a bunch of followers, and then charged people to be on it. And it's like, you should be able to, if you're not sure about a playlist, like literally go DM some of the smaller artists on that playlist and be like, yo, is this legit? Should I give this guy money? Which is a good way to start up a friendship, I might add. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, like, there's definitely valid playlists out there, but I think it's there's also a lot of uh, noise. And I think Venture Music in that TikTok, if I remember it correctly, does kind of address that. You know, it does, like, the golden age, like, here's the thing, ultimately, is the golden age of playlisting is over. Yes. You know, it used to be that, like, if you really did the homework and ground it out, and you were like right in the right niche of a niche, you could get on like 10 sick playlists that all those fans were on and you could just fucking do it and get your, you know, tens of thousands of monthly listeners. And I work with artists who are in that exact scenario, but they, you know, but then they put out a new album and they were like, Oh, the golden age is over. We're not getting added to more stuff. Yeah. For a lot of, that's just what it is. We should also make the caveat. The golden age of user playlists is over. Whereas editorials are still, I would argue strong as ever for sure. And doing your editorial playlist pitch is still one of the most important things you can do for your chance to do it. Cause that is an unbelievably seismic event. Many times when you get on those, especially Um, early in your journey, cowboy destroy asked a really good question. Um, how can artists be expected to try a bunch of bad playlists before you find a good playlist? And that's kind of why Jesse and I are saying like it's probably not worth the time and effort in most cases because you like unless you like are really like sitting there with playlist supply and like looking and trying to figure out like what is and is not legit and like hitting people up to figure out if it's worth it. It just seems like a much ado about nothing. I, so I have a, a caveat here that I've been starting to change my mind about in the two last two weeks. I got hit up by a guy named Aaron who makes this website called artist.tools, and I've been messing around with that a bunch, and that has very good botted playlist detection. 
Uh, and there it's very, very affordable compared to chart metric. I will say, so like one of my consulting clients called me after they got, I think, 100,000 plays of, from bots and then asked me if uh, they were fake plays and the site didn't detect that. But for the most part, what I've been doing, like when I look and I can see that a playlist is clearly botted from chart metric, from what I know, they've been pretty damn good with detecting it. And like, I feel like for the money, it is accurate enough that you're going to get rid of a lot of headaches from the jump if you're using that site. And it's, I can't remember how much money it is a month. I'm sure I could look it up right now while you talk. What do you call it? It's a, it's a really cool, good tool. Yeah. The point being, there are tools, you know, but like, I just, what I'm trying to say is I see fewer and fewer people in 2023 really popping off from user playlists. You know, yeah. it's not the same as it was two, three years ago. So I would just avoid this one by and large. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would avoid it if you're, if you're in the bigger genres, but if you're in obscure genres, I th still think a, a good example. Yeah. Like, like, like if you're into like a lot of the stuff I'm into the like, broader hyper pop stuff that the scamming just isn't a thing like i i literally i'm in those playlists all day most of them are legit fans a lot of them have emails and like it's not a bad community and the same thing even with like let's call it the more dirty punk stuff is like still really good but like truly some genres are cursed so I think it's really you got to yeah. learn what's right for your genre, which is I think also the same thing as for Submit Hub, is that there is people that Submit Hub wor works with for so well in some genres, and for some it is a just set the money on fire because that at least it'll keep you warm type thing. Absolutely. Now we have one that Jesse and I argue about all day. Well, actually, no. We agree well, uh, well, I mean, but, but I, I mean, maybe it's the context. I think we're going to agree on, which is that yeah. if you see Instagram ads. And it says, I'm going to grow your Spotify. You have someone who's selling you bots in a scam. Do you disagree? I just launched a Instagram <laughs> ad the other day. Because I was trying to test some stuff. <laughs> uh, but broadly speaking, yeah. Basically, a couple things here. One, most people telling you they know how to do ads do not actually know how to do ads. And this is why you look at the client base. Two, anyone who tells you if you give me $1,000, I will get you X amount of streams with certainty it is also scamming you. You know, you could give someone a ballpark estimate of how many streams that will get you. That's fine. Or what a best case scenario looked like with that budget. That's completely tolerable. But you should not be, you know, but do not hire someone who's saying, oh, 1000 bucks for 100,000 streams. And I actually had someone play himself. It was so funny because he was like, oh, I'm trying to decide between you and this guy who's like clearly a scammer. And he was like, if I gave you $30,000, how many streams would I get? And I was like, well, here's what happened over here, you know, but I can't guarantee that. He's like, oh, this guy guarantees. I'm like, well, that's because mm -hmm. it's bots. And I think that's like the thing is like people who speak in absolutes in terms of ads are fucking with you. Because like, think about it this way. Going in to doing an ad campaign with whoever, I have no clue how good the song is how good the video content they have to market the song is, uh, what the artist's reputation is in the scene a lot of the time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things are dramatically going to impact if an ad is successful or not, right? So I would just keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing I would keep in mind is, like, not all ads are fits for all types of artists. You know, that is to say I'm talking to an experimental artist right now and like, I don't know, we got to figure out like, cause I don't know if streaming ads are going to work for someone who does like 10 minute long experimental percussion things, you know? So I, we got to find something that we got to find something, we got to find another solution that fits for them. You know, uh, same with like sales ads. I think people see, this is why I don't talk about them that much. Like, you know, I do sales ads where we're getting 20, 30 times what we put in that, you know, but that's for major pop artists who you've heard of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, which, it's which, not I've always, which I've always said is the only people I think Facebook ads work well for is people with very like, stable. I can't, businesses. you know, I can't go get 20, 30 X uh, return on ad spend for anyone in this chat, you know, that, just because that's how it is.
Uh, so uh, the point I wanted to make here was much more, less about that just like we should blanketly ignore everyone with Instagram ads. But if you're finding somebody through an Instagram ad, if you're not talking to three of their clients who said that they did not know this person beforehand and they're doing good work, you're going to get scammed. And one of the best rules in this business is – I don't hire anybody unless I have three endorsements from them from somebody first. That can be an accountant. I just hired a new virtual assistant two weeks ago, and I had to get endorsements for that. I think it's a really big thing that, like, I know it sounds annoying to have to contact those people. It sounds annoying to have to say to the person, I need three references. But, like, it roots out so many things, and especially since you can get – I hate to use the word, but it's totally real, is that you can lose your fans also like get shadow banned and get your streams deducted on Spotify and they will basically tell you you don't exist if you overbought your uh, profile. So it's uh, very much worth it to just say, I'd like three references. Yeah. And anyone legit can just do that in a minute. Millennial Animal says everyone wants skinny jeans, but they don't fit everyone. And I would say you haven't been to Brooklyn lately, buddy. Those are out of style. Oh, Silent Script said next it'll be Grammy winning playlists. I'm looking forward to the day that a playlist is good enough to win a Grammy personally. Definitely not Luke says, would you suggest Spotify ads? I have never spoken to anyone who has liked a Spotify ad. Matt, have you? Assuming you mean the like on platform Spotify ads, yeah, those don't seem to do anything. Yeah, it, I've never seen anybody who said that. I got good ROI from that, and even that goes to my clients with million monthly listeners to the smallest of them. Derek Quiet House Recording has a question that says, "Do you think that ours with four hundred million streams on two or three songs and not more than fifty thousand streams on the rest of the songs is signs of bots or astroturfing?" Funny enough. That's a huge discrepancy, but like if we were saying 7 million to 50,000, what I often find is more often than not, that is somebody who is doing a lot of quantity of releasing music and the quality disparity between their songs is often terrible and not always that. Or in all honesty, one of the ones I saw uh, recently was just that some of the songs hit on TikTok and some of them don't. Yeah, and then the other thing is... Like, I manage um, this sort of radio rock band, Autumn Kings, and who I've talked about with Jesse extensively, and some of their songs are a lot higher, but it's just because those are songs that, like, were the perfect fit for the hard rock workout playlist, or were the perfect fit for discovery mode. They just, like, sometimes you'll see someone whose song, like, hits the algorithm in just the right way, where it's just like, oh, this has constant playthrough, this has constant... uh, whatever and so it just keeps getting fed to people so yeah i i mean i even think of too that if you looked at my friend's teen suicide's profile they have an insane disparity because some of their songs hit on tiktok i think another one was in like a movie and then the ones that weren't like they're in a lo-fi indie folky band most of the time and sometimes have grunge songs they're all over the place and so it makes it i think much more the sign of bots is like when you see that weird countries that this person should have no following in uh, that are bot countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia. That, like when that's a lot of the monthly listeners, that's that's the clue to me a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, Jason Mom Premier says, what about passing fires in your local area? I think that's one of the greatest uh, tricks right now is that everybody's so obsessed with online that fires go very far. Yes. The Q show has a question, but we're going to address that in a little bit here. It's two away. So we're coming to that one. Great. Q. Okay. Yeah. Let's, we, we, yeah, we're moving at a good clip, actually. So, Matt, was this yours or was this mine? Sinks. I think this is yours. Okay. Because it has then a typo. <laughs> Do you mean when I did this at 2 a.m. drunk, I misspelled things? This <laughs> is <laughs> like the dark secret. The dark dark secret of Matt and I's friendship is that it's the rarest thing in the world when we're both awake at the same time to text back and forth. Uh, Both awake and sober. Yeah, yeah, there we really go. Um, So anyway, I think one of the biggest bullshits sold these days is I will teach you how to get sinks. Because Sinks is still the last part of the industry that is 99.9% of the good stuff there 
is so gate kept and made all about a relationship. And this is because sinks largely are that one person is maybe two is asked to curate some choices for a song and a show. And you have to be on that person's radar. And it is a very, very difficult thing to get to the right thing, which is the other thing too is that's why those people usually make good relationships with labels. And this is one of the last benefits of why when everybody's like, why would you sign to a label today? Well, sinks are a lot of money and a lot of time it's labels who have the relationships with sink houses and that's why they sign to it. It's a literally a conversation I have constantly. Matt, what do you see here? A couple layers here. So I think that there is some legit stuff in sync that people are not taking advantage of enough, especially if you're a very certain type of artist, like uh, my friend XJ Will, who's kind of a sync influencer on TikTok. He tends to have a lot of really good advice, and I've spoken with him a few times. But I think the difference is that, like, he's someone talking about, like, oh, music libraries and stuff. And, like, when you look at the approach of, like, and I, I also, the main guy in Autumn Kings is also just, like, writes to spec. And it's like that you need to understand is a very di- like writing for commercials is a very different game than being a, like a touring artist. And you can make a lot of money that way, you know, but a lot more of it, a lot, that's a lot more like writing, a, writing and producing your own song every day and then having 20 songs, submitting that to a library, then writing another 20 songs and submitting that to a library and doing that. Right. Uh, but the people who are like, oh, well, I will get you in movies. You just have to pay me this monthly fee. Not it. Yeah, well, and particularly, I feel like there's all these courses that pop up and that are like, I will teach you to get syncs. And it's like, oh, man, like $2,000 of this. And it's like, it's. I feel like that. that's where we get into the thing that I really don't like about courses, which is just that they're often predatory in cost towards what a musician can afford versus what they get out of it. And that's the stuff that makes me very not happy about them. Yeah. So let's, let's pivot into this because this is our next thing. And the Q show is asking about it is like, you should not, if you're just starting out, especially do not go for the big investment. That means if you're putting out your first single and you have no audience, do not go and hire the $3,000 a song mixing engineer. Do not go and hire the $5,000 PR. Do not go and pay for a $10,000 course because Most of these courses are bullshit. Jesse, do you want to elaborate why? Most of these courses are one things you could find watching YouTube and TikTok in a matter of hours if you just did some searches because that's where their research assistant copied it from. Fun fact of why I started my YouTube channel. A very prominent YouTuber was reading from my book and I got mad and started making videos. That person also, I should say, sells a course with literally paraphrases of my book of, and I know it's like, sometimes you could be like, oh, well, all this information is the same. I came up with some of these terms myself. And this person literally has just adjectives switched from my fucking book. And I could sue and do cease and desist and embarrass them all day if I wanted to. But really the better thing to do is I try to put out what will obsolete them anyway which is people will just get enough information that they won't buy their shitty course. But the point being, so many of these courses also never get updated. They're so out of date. One thing I should also say, what people do all the time is they will send me these people's courses. And of course, I have to look after I get this email. And I can't fucking believe how inaccurate the information is in it for what they're charging. $2,500 fucking dollars for a bunch of stuff about telling you to use services that have been about out of business for two years. It's fucking unbelievable. Yeah. No, I mean, it's basically that. It's basically because, look, between, I think we could say 2016 to 2020 was kind of the death knell. There was this huge, like, get become a millionaire selling courses thing on the internet. And a lot of it was fueled by this guy, Russell Brunson, who actually does have a lot of good advice, but I think it got distorted and turned into a lot of malarkey. And Matt's been in Pennsylvania and, too long. You say malarkey. I know. I've, I've been at my parents. <laughs> but the point being, these courses, you have to realize that the vast majority of these courses are just a bunch of PDFs or like some videos. And they're done by people 
whose content that they put out for free is, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up my own ass or up Jesse's ass. Their content that they put out for free is not as valuable as Jesse and I's content. One of them paid me once to write like a guest article and then they turned around and they dumped it down so much. I was like, what's, and it was a pretty like basic article in the first place, you know, and I was pretty shocked, but like, that's consistently the thing is like what they're doing is they're trying to prey on people and charge exorbitant prices to get them into their course that they haven't updated in three years because people would rather spend money. What they realize is people would rather spend money than actually act on stuff because they feel like by spending money and buying this course, they're making progress in their music career. Yeah, that is a hundred percent dead on. And I think like the other thing too is like part of what makes them predatory is you don't see what's in the course until after you've bought it, and then you have this shit sandwich of lack of effort of their research assistant just paraphrasing other YouTube shows. And now, I, I, the funny thing, Matt mentioned Russell Brunson. What Russell Brunson does is he tells people to take other people's expertises and then sell them in these courses by creating funnels because Russell Brunson runs the grift that he owns the best tool for making funnels, uh, which is called ClickFunnels. And so he's basically selling all these morons to go into ChatGPT and saying, please paraphrase this uh, video so I don't get sued for copyright and then assemble it in a PDF and then sell it to you for $2,000 like the greatest secrets of all time. There is literally so many of these around. They're all advertising or they have YouTube channels where they try to use that as the funnel to sell it. And it's when people say, where's your course? I always say, not happening because I ain't doing that. Can I tell you the other thing I genuinely don't understand about uh, courses? Mm-hmm. And this might partially be like how I was raised or whatever, but like I've never really seen a course that was better than like this book. Mm-hmm. But we, um, I don't. Or like if you want, yeah. oh, I love this book. I know this book is like my life. But like, or Jesse's book. Like, like this is the thing: is like all these people writing courses have basically taken their information from a few core sources right, that are like music industry books, but more specifically, and this is important, a lot of them are just taking it from general business books and adapting it to the music industry. But guess what? All those business books, which will help you if you sit down and buy like the 10 best business books, that's, if you bought, if you went and bought hardcover 10 best business books, that's like 350 bucks if you have Amazon Prime. Like, and that's cheaper than all these courses and that's going to be dramatically more value. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Matt, this is yours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. This ties into the course thing. This is just something I've seen a lot. Um, it's also scam books you see a lot. Is This this uh, term you'll see is the new music industry. And you'll see so many people who will be like, how to get rich or how to get fans in the new music industry. They have been using the term, the new music industry, since I got involved in the music industry 13 years ago. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm genuinely confused about like when this new music industry started, because I was going through some old stuff and I found something talking about the new music industry from the mid nineties, which we would have described as the height of the old industry. And it's just like, oh, so that grift just has kept going. And so that's just a scam term that triggers me. That's all. So here's a, a fun thing. I should also say somebody's asking for our thoughts on a specific person. They clearly showed up late. We will not be discussing specific people because we don't want to be sued. My thing is this. Obviously, I have a book called The DIY Guide to the New Music Business. So Matt said this at one point, and I fa- have caveats, but then I thought about it. So why did I first name my book that? I ran... Facebook ads and Google ads as a test and saw what got the most clicks and then named my book what got the most clicks. Um, And using the new music business gets a ton of clicks, which is why people do it. But funny, I took it to heart what Matt was saying, which was that it's just like it's become so played out. And I've been rewriting that book and that is not in the title of the next edition. I've made 10 editions of Get More Fans and uh, the next one will be basically the same book at its core, basically the same skeleton, but with uh, what's called uh, a lot of muscle implants, some Elon Musk hair, you know, some some nice new fresh coat of paint. That's like genuinely crazy because Jesse's book like changed my life when I was 19. 
I want to keep this going. Somebody asked, I can't find the comment, how you, what ratios you use to spot inorganic listings. Yeah. And what's interesting is you can't really use a fixed ratio because the number disparities get different at different levels and they're different across genres. So dance artists and hip hop artists get so many more streams than rock, but they also seem to bot at much higher levels because honestly, those botters are making so much money. They grind harder with paying for the bots. And what I mean by that is, so let's say I had a playlist that I was scamming with called um, trap heaven. Whereas if you were an indie rock band and it was indie heaven, I could pay for 2,500 streams on bots and you'd be like, Oh, Okay, that was worth the $10 they did, and I kept five. Whereas charging $400 to be on Trap Heaven and throwing 150 for 200,000 streams, that makes that artist feel worth it. So you have to use lots of different things. What I always just say is I've watched enough, and I have enough tools, and I can look at the location data, that if I look at follows, monthly listeners, and their streams, I have a pretty good bullshit detector that I've honed over the years uh, when it comes to each genre, but yeah. I apply it to each genre. Matt, what do you see there? Ultimately, I think the only thing that really matters is how much money are you actually making? How many tickets are you actually selling? How much merch are you actually moving? That's what matters. Now, we're going to move into vanity metrics. And Joaquin Chavez asked a question. An artist in my scene I'd never heard of has huge monthly numbers for our genre, unusually high YouTube watch numbers, but has no label and their Bandcamp numbers are nothing. I don't understand it. And that's because of vanity metrics. Do you want to get into that, Jesse? Sure. Let's go. You start. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, this is this ties into sort of the ads thing we talked about earlier, like or the botted playlists. It's like and what Jesse just said. Smart motherfuckers, the people you want to be working with, see right through if something is botted or not. Or they see through if, oh, this person got on a bunch of good playlists in the good old days, but they're not actually worth any tickets or they're not actually going to sell any units, right? They're just a playlist artist, right? And that's fine. You know, like I work with super legit artists who get a lot of playlist streams who can't really sell that much. They're still trying to find other, you know, but they need to find... And that's great because they get a monthly paycheck, but they need to find their own path to profitability, essentially. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you can go and pay for fake followers or whatever, but if that's not real, that's not real. And But people still pay for it. And mm -hmm. that's what you'll see is you'll see there's an artist like this in New York who has like 50,000 Spotify monthlies, 30,000 Instagram followers, whatever. Jesse and I have talked about them. And it's just like, yeah, but bro, like, When's the last show you played? How many people showed up who you didn't know personally? Hell, how many people showed up who you didn't know personally? Eight. You know, like, clearly, you know, people see through it right away. And maybe you fool someone one time, but immediately after that, the word's going to get out that you're a fucker and that nobody should fuck with you. I, I think just the other thing with the vanity metrics is, is it's like anyone worth their salt sees through the bullshit. I think some of the indicators in that comment weren't necessarily true. Like I see all the time artists who like are doing well on one platform and not Bandcamp or another because you, if sure, you look, sure. you can see like, you know, a good example is there, there's an artist I really like. When I go to their Spotify, they have 1,000 monthly listeners, but their YouTube does great, but they are like, they make fucking incredible videos. So if you just looked at metrics, you'd see that you got to always look a little deeper. But anyone I know, even the dumber people in the music business I know, know how to look for that stuff. And I think that's the thing is, is like people all the time are like, oh, well, if I don't have my numbers, I can't get to show. It's like, well, the answer to get your numbers up is to do authentic things, not inauthentic behavior that people are going to see through and that is just going to cripple you. And it's just... Real thing, you're in an era of the music business where, like, I will never say you can't do bots because obviously big artists do bots. But if you get out of proportion with your bots, and it's easy to get out of proportion with bots when you have no authentic listeners, the thing that makes, like, when you see the Vice thing about, like, Gunna using bots or whatever, it's like, well, Gunna had 100 million plays that were authentic and then added to it with bots. And it's like that proportion just added. 10, 20%, which helped juice it a little. And like you, anything at all, since you have no authentic listens, doesn't do anything for you except for get you flagged and then get you shadow banned. All right, Matt. 
promoting your music in weird countries is your note here. Speak on it. We touched on this a little bit, but you'll see a lot is people, you'll see this, this is one of the most commonly wi- common ways you see playlists getting botted or you see like those guaranteed stream things going is like they go and they'll say, oh yeah, we'll get you a playlist. But if you go look at those people on that playlist, like all their streams are from Guatemala you know, uh, or Indonesia or whatever. And it's the same thing. Like you can get a lot of streams quickly with ads if you're targeting countries that you're never, ever going to play, but, or where they have these massive bot farms, but that doesn't benefit you. That doesn't give you anything, you know? Uh, And that's really all I'm trying to kind of address here is like, just look at that, you know, or even if you see, if you work with someone, you see all the streams come from a specific place. I remember we hired a playlister once, and all the streams were from St. Louis, and the artist was from San Diego. And I was like, come on. Like, don't <laughs> lie to me. Yeah, fun times. You know, so just keep that in mind. I don't have much to, much to add to that. So I think a good one to get to next would be record labels and management companies you pay to be on. Never have I ever. Now, Matt and I get into lots of discussions where I'm like, you said this thing as an absolute, here's an exception. I'll tell you what I've never heard an exception to. Anyone being happy with a manager or a record label they paid to be on. Matt, have you ever heard of that? Yeah. For the management company side, yes and no. Really? Uh, there are definitely managers out there who are on salary from the artist, but that's I, usually set up in a way where everyone in the band, everyone in the company is on salary. Yeah. And so it works a little bit differently. I, I was going to say, but that's, that, that, that's a difference. Like the, the difference I think is, is paying a good example. I get a lot of calls. This guy says he'll manage me for a thousand dollars a month and no percentage or and a percentage. And if they are agnostic about your music, they will do, do that for anyone. That's when it's bad. Whereas what, I think is fine at first is, you know, for example, I had to call some with somebody the other day and they're like, I'm paying my manager until there's income coming in. That's a totally different story is like they're in this until there's 10% or 15% a month to take. Then they're on salary to compensate for some of their work and they're investing more time in it to the point that it's basically minimum wage. Totally different story. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, and sometimes you see, you know, like, look, like I manage artists. Sometimes you have to take a rate cut on something because you're trying to like, you're trying to just get it over that hump because you know that like, we're going to get to this place. If we keep doing this stuff, you need to keep paying your bills. I have to have other ways to pay my bills, but if we keep doing this stuff and you can pay your bills next year and play 200 shows, then I'm going to make a ton of money. But that's a separate game. The record labels you pay to be on thing is like a really big one. You see a lot where... People will try to be like, oh, well, let's do this, that, or the other. And it's like, especially a record label, you pay like a monthly fee to be on. Like, nah. Like some labels, some now, now what will happen that is legit, just to be clear, if you're with a smaller label and you want to do vinyl, for example, sometimes the label might be like, yo, we don't have the money, but if you're willing to help fund the vinyl, yeah, we can distribute it. You know, but usually in that situation, you didn't pay to be there. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just they want to do a joint venture with you and yeah. they have distribution, etc. But again, all of this stuff, right? Cause the, like we're talking, like it might sound confusing because all these scams were pointing out exceptions to them. Right. But like, look, this is why you build your community. This is why you get more connections in the scene so that when someone offers you a deal, you're not sure about, you can go hit up six friends who are assigned to small indie labels and be like, we got offered this deal. It, does this seem like something real? Yes or no? You know, because like sometimes I see deals that throw me that I'm not necessarily sure I'm comfortable with. But guess what? I go to Jesse. I go to like four or five more of our friends, and I go, "Hey, this is what was offered. It seems atypical, but this actually would work." But like this is why you build community so that you can know this actually does seem legit, even if some of the things don't seem like they're completely logical. Do I do it? This is also a good thing for the advice and why it's so important to have a lawyer who understands your genre. Like people all the time be like, 
well, can I use your lawyer? And I'm like, my lawyer works in emo and you're a dance group. They don't know the standards of what record labels offer in dance. You need a lawyer whose head's in the game seeing the standards of your dance of dance every day if you're a dance person who's being offered a deal. The d- standards across genres and across this business are all over the place because no one knows what anything costs. And you see so many different things, which is why you have to do exactly what Matt just said, which is reach out to other people and be like, yo, do these numbers look concurrent with what you see these days? In fact, even too, if you looked at an Atlantic Records deal from 2009 compared to 2023, you wouldn't even recognize it. I have done that. And it's the thing. It's like you need somebody who's current with standards that are current and what's the going things. Because also, lawyers are always inventing new scams to get their clients weird things. And that's how you get situations like if you guys Google victory records problems in contracts, you could read some of the biggest scams you'll ever see in the history of the music business. Jesse, do you want to... Cowboy Destroy brought up two good scams. Do you want to touch on those first or do you want to touch on our last thing? Have you ever heard of that paying a label to mix and master? A a label? Well, it'd be one thing if the label is a mixer and mastering engineer who does it. That'd, That'd be fine, but I've never heard of that otherwise, Matt. Correct. I like that there's... I'm looking down at my phone to look at the comments and as I look... There's an ad for a scam company (laughs) (laughs) being played on the stream. Hell yeah. So, sorry, Cowboy Destroyer. I do want to answer your question. So, yeah. So, broadly speaking, like, you do see these producers who get, like, a distro deal with The Orchard, and then they try to, like, be like, oh, I'll put you out of my label if you pay me. That seems like kind of a scam, in my opinion. But also, the other way this question could go is, like, Sometimes your label might just straight might just not give you enough money to pay for someone to mix and master. And then you just need to go and pay someone yourself. You know, it just, it gets sketch if they didn't give you an advance and then they say, you need to go work with this person. They might suggest someone, you know, or they might have someone they have a bro deal with like Ripple Music, a label I own a piece of. We don't usually give a lot of advances, but like we do have like people we recommend you work with, but we try to be very clear that like getting uh, Tony from Moss Generator to Master Your Record is a strong suggestion because he's done a bunch of other really good records in that niche. Go do what you want to do, but this guy will do it at a bro rate. So just, you know, because he's he's our friend. So just keep that in mind, you know. Uh, The other question Cowboy Destroy asked was, talk about the people on TikTok asking you to play their song for money or paying for reviews. I have to tell you, that and the YouTube reactions, I have consultation clients where that has been a very big thing for them with a great ROI. One of my good friends who I is my neighbor, they paid to be on a YouTube reaction thing recently. And their band at their peak at 40,000 monthly is like they have fans they can play. But that literally like got one of their songs from like 10,000 streams to 100,000 because it was a perfect thing. It was a perfect fit. The song is like kind of got some shocking lyrics and the, the reaction to it was really well produced, but like paying, I think 200 bucks for that was amazing. I'm not against all what I would call astroturfed gatekeeping of influencers. I mean, let's be honest. I do spawn con on this fucking channel all day long. I'm living my life. And uh, Matt's living his little SpawnCon life, too. It's how we make some of our money. That doesn't mean that the people we make these videos for aren't very happy. I say authentic things. I say what I believe. In fact, the video I put out today, I mean, literally, I put a caveat in there about all sorts of things. I don't think that that's necessarily an always bad thing. I would just make sure, yet again, that they've been doing these things and it's been getting numbers. Absolutely. Couple of things here. Two more good questions that came in. Do deal memos allow you to spot scams or do you need a detailed contract? And so with that, deal memos in my experience have generally allowed me to spot a scam. Obviously, you want to have a lawyer go over the contract and make sure it's still basically what it said in the deal memo. A good caveat to this actually is is it, one of the reasons you have to watch the contract too is you say, I want this changed, and Matt and I will tell you, like we've lost weeks of our lives of progress to things because the record label says, okay, we'll change that, and then you get a revision, and that revision's not in there. Is the same fucking percentage that you they said they would change is still sitting there, or it jumps back a version and comes back in with the old percentage. Like, you got to yeah, remember. Just real fast. For, yeah, go ahead. 
people who don't know, a deal memo is basically before you get your contract, before the label pays a lawyer to make it, essentially what you're doing is you're getting like 15, 20 bullet points that are like, these are the terms of the deal. And they send that to you to kind of agree to in principle before they make a contract. And then the other one that came up was about paying for press. So I want to point something out here. And he here, Hillary talks about a metal band getting solicited to pay for a feature in a big hip-hop publication. And... Wait, wait, a metal Here's band paying for a hip hop publication? That's what it is. A metal band was randomly solicited to pay for a feature in a big hip hop publication. So here's the thing blogs and stuff like that, unless you're very big, do not get clicks. You know, paying for a review on a website, even a big website in your genre, if you're an unknown artist, is not going to convert anyone. And I've seen it happen time and time again where, like, I used to write for a really big website in metal. And I wouldn't charge anyone for that. I would just like do premieres because it was people asked me to, whatever. But like, I would look at the SoundCloud numbers after, you know, because you do the premiere in SoundCloud or the YouTube video. And it's like, oh, this got you an extra 35 views. And that was like one of the biggest metal websites. And that's not, that's not because that metal website is a scam. It's because people aren't checking out new artists on small blogs um, or big blogs or whatever. I think that's an interesting thing because it's yet again some nuance. Like one of the things I see over and over again. In fact, I can I can talk about this example because he he's let me is Ryan, my partner, is in a band called Super Bloom, and I remember he said that like they didn't get a lot of streams from a premiere, but then what it was was it was all the right people who heard it because then he got hit up by tons of managers and big opportunities. Some publications are absolutely fantastic, and some are not influential at all. I mean, a good example. If in emo, if the alternative is tweeting about you from your account, there's going to be so many people who check out your stuff that are influential people in the business, influencers, playlisters, that it's going to start getting the ball rolling. I mean, literally the best record I've worked on in months is up on this Pro Tools right now. And it's one of those artists that like they championed and now they're signed to a big label. We're doing a remix and a remaster. And this band's probably headed for really big things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but I guess what I'm saying is that oh, that never comes from a paid placement somewhere. So we have one more point here, which you actually added last minute, I think. So do you want to go into it? <laughs> ah, I did add this last minute. I remember. Okay. One of the ones I see that's really funny that's been going around and like, Matt and I have been talking about doing this all summer, and it was like kind of we like collected uh, the scammers over the course of the summer. But the funniest one I see rising now on my TikTok, you know, the thing I'm addicted to, is people who use vocabulary intimidation. And what I mean by that is they say terms that no one would ever fucking use, so you feel stupid like you have to learn from them. The funniest thing is, is like one of the things I've learned so much over the years. Now, let's remember, my day job is... I have to make podcasts and articles that communicate very complex things. A good example is yesterday I literally had to explain why unemployment is so low, inflation's high, but the economy is considered the best it's ever been in America, yet it doesn't feel like it's so many people. Not easy to do. You do not do that by talking about stagflation, Minsky moments, and all these terms that are going to intimidate people. You do it to bring in. But what a lot of these scammers do is they try to intimidate you by making you feel like you don't know things and you then have to pay them to do it. Yet again, unfortunately, like we said, Russell Brunson, not all bad. Technique, he unfortunately teaches people to do, which I think is, yet again, predatory and scummy and I don't like. But my general rule of thumb, if you feel like you're moderately knowledgeable and somebody is saying lots of big words that they'll teach you the secrets to, they're fucking scamming you. Yeah, and it's like, one of my goals is one of the biggest moments I had kind of like understanding like how bacon spits needed to be was my grandma doesn't speak English as a first language, still has a really strong accent when she speaks English. You know, I only speak French to her. And she was like, oh, I watch your videos and I like them because I can understand everything. And my grandma is like an 80 year old woman from Florida who's never played an instrument in her life or from France who lives in Florida who's never played an instrument in her life. Right. But like, that was like a moment where I was like, oh, like I need to keep this fairly straightforward English because I have a big international following, you know, and I'm trying to grow internationally. And I'm also when I'm taking meetings with high level managers from Poland, guess what doesn't play 
when you're dealing with a scary Polish death metal manager <laughs> is, is trying to use a term like EBITDA or something because they're just going to hate you. <laughs> like, you know, like nobody at a high level in the business is like trying to show off all the vocabulary words they know. Right. Like straight up. Like, in fact, one of the best compliments I ever got from one of the highest level managers I work with was he like a manager who works with arena artists was, you know, and he's, he's in his fifties. And he said, you know, Matt, what I like about you is you can explain tech stuff to me and I don't feel like an idiot. Yeah. And that's like the point, right? Is that like my grandma can like get something out of bacon's with that? Like guys over 50 running the music business can be explained social media concepts because of, I'm doing it simply. Anyone who has to try to overwhelm you with that, you know, a smart person can explain something complex to a six-year-old. That's what it is. Yeah, and I, I think in general, the things I find, I, you know, it's like a really funny thing. I, I am literally, I get a lot of things wrong. One thing I never get wrong is when I see a YouTuber come onto the scene and they condescend people about the things they do. Now, granted, I jokingly will make fun of musicians and condescend the dumb things they do, but it's to play up the humor on the channel of this and make people feel better about not doing some things. But like, if you condescend while you're explaining tech and they're like, you, you know, you truly, I can see that your channel is not going to grow instantly all the time. And I've never been wrong about that. When I see the person who tries to vocabulary intimidate, try to show off who, how smart they are and try to make people feel dumb for that. The one exception I may say is like edge Lord metal explainer channels, but that's a different story. And the reason somebody like Finn does so well is he tries to present information in a way that everybody's going to understand no matter what their knowledge level. Yeah. Anyway, the point being it's stupid. People who try to make you feel stupid are insecure about their own stupidity. I think that that is a great place to uh, leave it. You can follow me at Jesse Cannon. You can follow Matt at Bacon Bits online. We're going to do some broad Q&As after this, I think we discussed, Matt. But I think this is it for our themed streams of the summer uh, here. We'll be doing some other things, so you should follow us so you know when we do that. Absolutely. And it's at bacons.bits, just yeah. for the record. Yes, yes. Thank All you, right. everyone, for watching. Follow follow for more. DM for private consultation. That's right. All right, thanks. I said the thing. You said the thing. That means it's done. <laughs>